Under the best of conditions and conditioning, covering 460 kilometres by foot is a daunting prospect. Take this from someone who completed a 100 kilometre ultramarathon last year. I wouldn't be narrating to you right now, pushing up daisies or feeding cacti, if I had to go another 360 kilometres. On top of the sheer distance, the equivalent of Christchurch to Dunedin or Paris to Frankfurt, underfoot as well, you are trudging through sand, which we all know how energy sapping that is. During the day, it's also the high 20s and at night it's minus 5. To further add to the Herculean effort, you are injured as are two of the others on the journey, leaving just one who is in one piece. To further hamper things, you are beginning the trek with no food. One metal tin containing 14 pints of water for all four of you, rationed to a quarter of a pint a day. A poultry of six tablespoons, that's according to my wife, and who am I to argue? That drum of water you take turns carrying, no training, no proper footwear or clothing, and the leader of your ragtag foursome, the man out front, guiding the motley troop is a practical joker type kiwi straight off the farm a soldier with the nickname skin who walks with a distinctive gait and flailing windmill like arms as I've said before on previous videos you never really get to know who is a hero coward or in between till the bullets start flying it's been a fair while since we've had a conflict which involved average Joe Blows leaving their safe homes and jobs and being thrown into a kill or be killed situation. Most people today have long since replaced soldiers, sailors and airmen with sports men and women when conjuring up heroes to aspire to. Now take 15 seconds to concoct a few sports people you consider epitomise mental and physical strength. The tough pricks. Then, by the end of this two part video series, if you think any of them are tougher than the bespeckled Kiwi from Matter Matter, plonk their names in the comments. This first part deals with the lead up to his trek to freedom, which is equally enthralling. Overlooked. The 26 year old Corporal Ronald Moore became a member of the Long Range Desert Group in 1940. One of the soldiers serving with the New Zealand 2nd Division based in Cairo that volunteered for this new unit, set up to reconnoitre and harass the Italians in Sudan and Libya. Using the now iconic converted Chev trucks with nicknames like Tiana. With a cavalier seat of your pants attitude, they fully embraced the founder's notion that they were pirates of the sands. The British sent these units into the wastelands to cause mischief and be the army's eyes and ears on the ground, dampen enemy morale and expend resources chasing tales. And don't worry, in future I will do a dedicated video at some point solely on the Long Range Desert Group. What came as a surprise to me researching this was the type of unit we are talking about here wasn't a new concept. The Australians in particular sent forth light car patrols in the First World War using stripped down Model T's. To quickly go back to the 2nd New Zealand Infantry Division under General Bernard Freiburg, they fought in many spheres of the war. The expeditionary force having left New Zealand in January 1940, arriving Egypt February. They would see action not just in the western deserts, Crete, which I covered recently in the poignant story of Ted's unopened bottle, Greece and finally Italy. The second division fought right up to the German surrender in Italy, which occurred five days, the 2nd of May 1945, before overall capitulation. Even then, for some, the war continued even after the Japanese surrender, becoming part of the occupation forces. Back to where we are talking, the lads of the second put up with incessant flies, burning sun, lack of clean water, 
the back-breaking task of digging ditches and digging things out of sand, constantly uncoiling barbed wire and laying mines. As I paint you the background, there's an in-ground perception regarding this theatre of war, which tends to skew the view of the fighting spirit and composition of the Italian army in the desert from a Commonwealth perspective. And some of this is well founded, and since the average Italian didn't share Mussolini's enthusiasm to recreate a new Roman Empire, if it meant losing an arm. Not all the Italian forces migrated to tanks with one forward gear and three reverse. There were those that were up for the fight. Some of the more staunch Italians just happened to be facing the LRDG out in the ocean-like wastes of the deserts. When it came to roaming the deserts, on paper the Italians were streaks ahead of the Allies as the war unfolded for them on the 10th of June 1940. The Italian Auto Saharan Company had been operational since 1923, patrolling the surrounds of Libyan forts. When it came to negotiating and navigating the often featureless landscape, their expertise in the desert gave them distinct advantage over, say, a farmer from Matamata in New Zealand. Google in Central North Island NZ from above. Now, where we are focusing on in the Libyan desert, what the place more called home looks like today. Exactly the setting of the start of the story of survival, and the preservation qualities of the environment and remoteness of the setting means, improbable as it sounds, you can still visit this site today. See the abandoned vehicles. Make sure you factor the site in on your next family holiday there. Then again, perhaps the weather in Fiji may prove a wee bit better. The Italians therefore had a huge head start on the Allies in terms of equipment, experience, training and in sheer numbers in the specialist Auto Saharan Company, as far as I could find, three times the troops as the Allies. What also made it an adversary to be wary of was the integration of reconnaissance aircraft into each unit, including long-range bombers like the one on your screen, as well as fighter aircraft the only ones on the Allied side to regularly run a similar integrated system were the French Jan and Chad. The significance of this framework will become more obvious as we go on further to the heart of the story in part two. To counter this, there was however one person on the Allied side so that would go close to making up the entire deficit, a significant asset who knew the lay of the land better than any foreigner the first documented man to cross the Libyan desert east to west, renowned desert explorer Ralph Bagnold. The same Ralph Bagnold that championed for what he termed acts of piracy, the first man to lead the long-range desert group. Now Major Ralph Bagnold, a pioneer on many fronts, he self-designed sun compasses that would prove invaluable navigational tools, wrote a fair chunk of the in-house training manual on desert warfare. One would think that was an impressive enough CV as it was. However, his main claim to fame, though, was probably his ability to use his knowledge of the desert patterns to create visual deceptions, make the enemy think there were deployments where there weren't. Conversely, think they weren't there, when they were. He set up a production line of dummy tanks, artillery pieces, aircraft and even constructed a 200 mile railway line that appeared real unless you got a metre away. Bagnold was also an eccentric par excellence, at one point having been side shifted from the role in the LRDG. He simply disappeared for six months, presumably to a remote location, and then reappeared as if nothing had happened. His partner in crime when it came to the subterfuge was Dudley Clark, who was equally on the edge of the spectrum. He had a fetish for dressing in women's clothing. That is his Spanish police mugshot. The British at the time simply ignored their idiosyncratic characteristics 
and gave the outside the box thinkers a long leash. Laugh as we may today at Indiana Jones Bagnold and Kinks Lola Clark. They both played an unappreciated role in winning the Desert War. Their dummy deployments at the decisive Battle of Alamein. Falling Rommel. I'll tell you what, there's a hangman left, right and centre in the story. On Boxing Day 1940, two combined patrols, G and T, left their Cairo base and, and went into the expanses of the Libyan desert. Amongst the 76 men was Corporal Ronald Moore. He's located at the right of this column and closest to the camera. Along with two Scotsmen, John Easton and Alex Winchester. That's John Easton. I did try and locate a photo of Winchester. I reached out to the LRGG Preservation Society. With sadly no luck. And then we've got Englishman, the Private Alf Ty, who was also a part of the Royal Ordnance Corps and probably shouldn't have been bouncing in the back of a truck, having just received an operation and for his stomach ulcer. Still, you know the stoicism of the men of his ilk. Their mission was to drive 1,600 kilometres through the province of Fezzan to the oasis town of Merzouk, undetective, which was easier said than done. They were going to go through landscape that was hard on man and machine. Next to no intelligence on Italian dispositions, using maps that became obvious, were out of date, and at a scale that was confusing. To further complicate things, then 150 miles from the town, clandestinely rendezvous with 12 free French from Chad, who were also in on the deal. Attack. Then if things went swimmingly at Merzouk, Hightail it to the relative safety of Chad, and Chad being Free French, whilst their neighbours in Niger was a Vichy French. And if the Vichy spotted you, they'd demand you surrender, and failing that, they would open fire. Then, for good measure, if that wasn't enough adventure for one day on the way back to Egypt, with the entire Italian desert army and air force wanting your guts for garters, the net closing. Have a crack at Kufra, another town with plump pickings. The main claim to fame of Murzuk, then and now, is its Ottoman fortress. The town at the time was garrisoned by Italian troops. Further, it possessed an airfield that served as a major base for those Caproni light bombers, as well as being a large supply depot in terms of fuel and supplies. On the morning of the 11th of January 1941, the force was on the outskirts of the town. You would have thought the dust from 23 vehicles approaching the town would have been spotted by the Italians, whether out of complacency, thinking it was an easy lark well away from the real fighting, sheer incompetence perhaps, or sleeping on the job. The two waves, one attacking the fort in town, the other, the airport, were on top of the Italian defenders before they knew what hit them. In fact, they had secured a guide on the way in. En route, they'd come across the town's Italian postmaster, come postman, who was out doing a mail run on his bike. He ended up indicating which way to go at the point of a gun. This is a real photo of the attack on the town of Merzouk. Photography of any kind was meant to be banned at the front, but many a Kiwi servicemen, like Trooper Jopling, ignored that command, snapped away. Most of the photos that now exist of Free French Forces in action in Chad and Libya are from Kiwi collections. That's the aerodrome burning. The Italians did put up a stiff defence. In one incident at the attack on the aerodrome, a machine gun nest was destroyed by something driving over it. The fort, however, proved impregnable, even to the trucks mounted with Beaufort guns. After two hours of a firefight, the Italians surrendered. Discounting the two men killed and three wounded, one of those being the French commander, and one of the wounded, a French officer who cauterised the bullet hole in his leg with a cigarette and went on as if nothing had happened, the raid was a major success. 
aircraft, fuel and ammunition stores destroyed. As a military base, the township was effectively knocked out of the war. It was time for the wanted men to scarper away from the scene of the crime. The element of surprise, having been well and truly now lost. They knew the Italian Auto Saharan Company would be on their tail. Outposts alerted they could be next. They headed south to the relative safety of free French occupied Chad to await the dust to settle. For the pay, the base at Kufra, a similar hello. Do you think hangmen like this would take the chicken route to Chad? You'd be right. They would raid every Italian post they could on the way to recoup in Chad. What they did get up to will all be in part two, along with Moore and his companion's amazing survival story. Stay tuned. If you'd like a story about heroics in Africa whilst waiting for number two, check out the 10 minute video I did about the crew from D for Dog, plus the aforementioned at Ted's Bottle set in Crete. A bubbly thing should pop up on your screen, or you can look in the description. Thanks to those who have subscribed to my low-tech New Zealand history project. I appreciate it. Bye for now.